Hey friends, so welcome to part 6 of the Google UX course review. Apparently I'm on my way to becoming a fully certified UX designer after all these years, so yeah, nice. This part of the course explores web design, responsive web design and Adobe XD, which is going to be a nice change after that mobile app in the previous part of the course. And of course, already having a mobile app, it only makes sense to have a website design, but then you can go, you know, a step further. You can have like a smart fridge app or, you know, just something out of the ordinary. I'm just giving you some ideas here. This part of the course, however, has a pretty weird structure because I have no idea why responsive web design in Adobe XD was grouped together in just one block with job searching because basically that's what it is the first five weeks of this part of the course are all about responsive web design and then week six is completely different it's not about designing anything it's more about your portfolio your case studies and job applying and whatever but it is weird because i believe that job searching and understanding the industry that you're in is really really important because that's kind of like the knowledge that can land you the job you know right after your portfolio and grouping that together with responsive web design is kind of I don't know, it's just, I don't understand this completely. Okay, starting from the beginning. I really like how they explain all the different breakpoints or screen sizes and why it's actually important. Because I actually noticed that a lot of junior designers, when they get a task of creating a mobile version of a website, they just take the website and kind of shrink it down to that size, but it's all like super small fonts, very unreadable, very unpleasant to look at. So you learn how to modify layouts to actually make them match the smaller size. And that makes sense because just shrinking them is not gonna cut it okay adobe xd so this whole part of the segment is about teaching you another seemingly free tool to design called adobe xd but if you don't really like to use adobe products like myself or if you don't really want to install the creative cloud app that's running in the background and hogging resources of your laptop you can still do all of those assignments and all of those exercises in figma and what is great that they actually kind of thought of that that they don't really need to force you to use adobe xd you can use it of course to learn it and it's pretty useful i guess but if you want to use figma or other tool you can still use it there is some extra reading materials on how to do these exact same things in figma so you don't really have to use adobe xd it's just an option and i think having an option is really great the actual adobe xd the exercises aren't really that precise so sometimes especially if you're a beginner you'll have to pause the video and really think about what happened on the screen they tell you like let's make a rectangle and let's change the color but they don't really show you where it's done and to some people that might be intimidating and it might be actually taking them slower to follow i liked however that they mentioned that design tools come and go and they gain and lose popularity so it's all about learning how to use the design tool general principles they're surprisingly similar so if you learn one you're gonna be fine with like a lot of them okay let's get back to some naming convention remember columns and alleys in the previous video well right now they're back to columns and gutters but it turns out that alleys is a way that figma is calling that and i have no idea why is it so because it's really not an industry trend it's not an industry naming convention so they're kind of breaking the rule just to i don't know mess with people or to make it harder Oh, and sticker sheets are called UI kits, so kind of like I told you in the last video. Once again, in this part of the course, you choose a project from a randomized list generated by some colorful generator. And I picked a music selling and previewing website for a musician in Iowa. And I chose this because I actually finished high school in Iowa, so I felt like a connection with this particular randomized assignment, so I decided to just go with this. And at first when I realized that you have to go through all that personas and empathy mapping and problem statements and everything all over again, I was like, oh, come on, that's pretty lazy of you, right? It's kind of like condensing the entire first five parts of the course into one and then adding some additional design exercises on top of that. And I think that this is leaning a little bit too heavily into the non-design aspect. So there is like a lot of ideating, thinking, writing, and really not a lot of designing, which is bad. But I think that it's also mostly made to reinforce the process in you. So you know that the UX process is something you follow to make those products, 
But in reality, many of these things, as I said before, are not really part of the process in like a typical workflow. And of course, I'm going through this course at a very fast pace. And for many people, it's going to take a few months. So if you're just going back to course number six, few months after you started, it's pretty good to actually refresh some of those initial things. So after all, I don't think it's a bad idea, but I really wish there was more actual hands-on designing here. Most of the quizzes in part six are actually a lot easier than in parts three, four, and five, which might be good or might be bad. It depends on what you're expecting. Okay, now let's talk about the approach and especially the approach that Google has towards scribbled paper wireframes. And I understand the idea because paper is something most people are comfortable with and it's pretty easy to start with, but those scribbled lines are not gonna cut it. This is not how the industry works and there are a couple of reasons for that. But the main reason that those scribbly kind of very low fidelity paper wireframes are pretty useless is that without having the text on them and without having the context, they're practically unreadable to everybody except you and you yourself will also forget about all that stuff. So imagine yourself a week or two after you made those paper sketches. Do you still remember what that scribbled line there was? I wouldn't. So it's not really about completing the wireframe super fast and doing those scribbles to save time. It's about having a wireframe or a concept sketch that's gonna be understood by other people so you can communicate your ideas better. And if you only have scribbled lines and placeholders for everything, it's just not gonna be clear. And continuing on the subject of those scribbled lines, when you go digital, when you start to digitize your wireframes and start to using a design tool to make them, Google is also pushing lorem ipsum a lot. It's basically a placeholder. It's some words that don't really make any sense and people kind of use it to fill in the space with text. And while it may seem like a good idea, it's really not. Because if you're making a wireframe and especially a high fidelity prototype, at some point it's gonna be the same thing as with the scribbled lines. You're not gonna remember what that second line of lorem ipsum meant comparing to the first line of lorem ipsum. So really you need some headers, you need some actual content on there. And I believe the good approach to this is actually to make stuff up. Because if it's a wireframe, you can just start writing semi-relevant things yourself to make it more real. And by making it more real, it's gonna be a lot easier for you to process and to understand and to also come up with additional ideas. And when you see just a page full of lorem ipsums, it can be anything. And that's not really the goal of designing. Design needs to go from the vague towards the specific and there is no specific with dummy text. Okay, I guess this is the moment that we've all been waiting for. High fidelity designs, right? And don't get me wrong, I know that these designs that they're making as part of the course can't be too polished. They can't look really like a dribble shot. They can't be too beautiful because that would be very intimidating to the beginner designers. So I get that. I get that it's not supposed to be super pretty just yet and you'll get to the pretty when you get more experience, but still. There are some issues there that I don't understand and I want to mention them. The first thing is that they went with a very narrow gutter width. And this is bad because that actually enforces you to create little white space within groups of elements. Let me explain. The columns are used to place the content in and then the gutters are used for spacing between the different types of content. So if like a photo of a book cover is taking two columns and then you have an extra two columns on the side for all the descriptions, you only have one gutter width to actually space them apart. And in many cases, a very small gutter width is not going to be enough because there's just going to be too little white space between those two elements to look any good. And this is kind of what happened here. So text is just too close to the book covers and it doesn't look good. It doesn't look that readable. And in some places, they actually ignore the layout completely like here. And it's even more prominent in the very small objects on the screen, like small little sections where the distance between the sections is actually the same as the distance within the sections. And it really doesn't work. It kind of breaks the layout, breaks the structure and destroys the hierarchy because it's just all becoming one. So whenever you can, and if you're making a layout, go with gutters that are at least 24 points or even above that, because that will give your layout in enough breathing, enough space to actually feel like a nice readable experience. And the choice of the heading font is also something I wouldn't really go with for beginners because as I said before, if you're a beginner, you should not experiment with fonts and colors. So if you're making an app or a website, use black, white, and just one color, one accent color. Don't go crazy with colors. And same with fonts. There is a group of fonts that is considered safe. 
So no matter what you do, how big is the font, how thick is the font, it's still gonna look good. And these are mostly sans serif fonts for a reason, because they're simpler, they're more easy to actually place within any kind of interface and they're still gonna look good. So the more you deviate from that kind of simple structure of a font into something more decorative or something more fancy, the harder it is to actually make it well. And especially for beginners, you should really stick to the safe fonts. I mean it. So decorative serif fonts like the one used in this example are very easy to go wrong. If you pick a font like that, it can just backfire at you right away and break your entire layout. What I like is that they showed that all of the icons that you import into your artboards and use on your projects are actually very simple shapes. So some of the simpler ones like the back arrow or the X to close the window, you can actually use the standard shapes that you have in the design tools to make them. And this is great because making some of those simpler ones in place without having the need to actually go to external files and look for them is going to save you a lot of time. The problem is that they show you how to do it with rectangles and if you're making Making simple icons like that, it's definitely better to use lines than filled rectangles because with lines, you can always increase or decrease the line thickness so you can modify the icon a lot easier. And when it's rectangles, it's pretty difficult to modify. But aside from that little fact, I think that the fact that they showed you you can do some little icons in place is great. So here's how you can make like a search icon, just create an oval, a line group it and rotate it 45 degrees. And in many cases, this is going to take you less time than if you were to go into an external library and look for that icon. Okay, so what's the conclusion here? Let's start with this. Designing websites is a lot more difficult than designing apps. It's simply a lot easier to create a chaotic mess on a larger canvas. The more space you have, there is more places where things can go wrong. So while this part of the course is a pretty good start about understanding responsive design, how it works, where it comes from, and what are some good practices, you'll need to do a lot more designing on your own to be any good. And the most important aspects are covered pretty well here. So you'll get a solid foundation and you'll be able to not make a lot of the rookie mistakes. Just don't use the lorem ipsums and try to make your icons using lines and you'll be fine. So the sixth part of the course isn't bad, but as with all of the other parts, it's not gonna make you a designer. It's just gonna give you enough knowledge to explore on your own. But if I was looking at it from an employer perspective, I wouldn't hire people who only knew how to kind of modify responsive design a little bit, but had no actual designing skills. It's always the portfolio that matters, the portfolio with like a lot of projects in them. So be ready to practice a lot, because after you get that initial understanding of responsive web design, there's still a lot of additional patterns, additional concepts and additional differences between the different breakpoints that you can take into account. And this course only really covers the basics. All right, thanks for watching, like, subscribe, drink a glass of water, and I'm gonna catch you guys in the next one. Cheers.